In a world where it seems totally normal to listen to a podcast about the Toronto Argonauts, it's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos post-game reaction podcast. I'm your host, Ben Grant, and we are in a celebratory mood tonight as the Argos, for only the third time this season, walk away winners. We're winners, baby! Improving the record to 3-12 and as they take down the Ottawa Red Blacks 28-21 and knock them out of playoff contention in the process. And there was actually a lot of exciting stuff to look forward to in this game, considering we were going in to watch a 3-11 and team take on a 2-12 and team. There were actually a lot of storylines. Uh, it's the first game of the third pinball era, so everyone kind of wanted to see you know, what that would bring. Uh, it, technically, I guess, we had two of the last three Grey Cup champions going head-to-head, and obviously that's a little misleading. And it was country night at the stadium. They had Argos cowboy hats that they were giving away, and they, they, they obviously uh, were a little bit more optimistic than I might have been when they were making this order. So usually, you know, when you go to a game where there are giveaways, it's like first 5,000 fans get whatever it is, bobblehead. And these were really nice cowboy hats with an Argos logo in the front. And there were so many of these hats at the end of the game. They were giving them away instead of the t-shirt cannon, which they usually bring out throughout the game. But you can give away t-shirts anytime. Those don't really expire. You can only give out cowboy hats on country night so every five minutes they're going through the stands throwing around hats to people who already have hats like there's there weren't that many people in the stadium everyone had a hat but you know everyone had two hats by the end of the night so that was you know country night was fun you know it was a a really good environment everyone had a great time at the game winning helps but it was a really nice environment and that was a nice promotion that i'd like to see them bring back maybe on a warmer evening it was it was not pleasant weather-wise it was windy a very strong wind coming off the lake uh, south to north it was freezing cold i forgot my jacket which was a big mistake on my part and you know we're trying to evaluate we're trying to look at you're using this game to try and figure out who are we going to stick with going forward who's still giving us an effort who wants to play who wants to be here which coaches should we bring back and so there was a lot of stuff going on that way and i think this game maybe is a little bit misleading. Like, yes, it's a win, but for, for Ottawa, I know they were still mathematically alive, but for them to get into the playoffs, a, a number of impossible things had to happen. So I think they had pretty much given up on this season. And for them, it was a little bit like open mic night where they had new guys at so many different positions that they were, they were trying out. Will Arndt, the quarterback, making his first ever start. Uh, actually, he had some really nice moments, and we'll talk more about him later. But Will Arndt was, was playing semi-pro in Alberta in Fort McMurray a couple of years ago. And now here he is starting in the CFL for the Ottawa Red Blacks. And so when you've got the other team sending out Arndt as a quarterback, nothing against him, but and it's not the same as, as going against some of the other guys in the league. And the Red Blacks backfield was wonderful to see, all Canadian. Uh, we had Brendan Glanders in there from uh, U of Ottawa and Greg Morris who's a Toronto area guy. He, was, he actually went to Donald Wilson High School in Toronto uh, before going down to University of New Mexico, I think. I want to say New Mexico. And again, those guys are, you know, they're great Canadian players. It's wonderful to see, but they're not guys that you necessarily have to scheme for. They're not guys that you have to game plan specifically. How are we going to deal with these two guys here? And so I, I, think it's, I think this result for the Argos, while it felt very positive, is a little misleading. Uh, not that there weren't Argos that didn't play well, and we'll get to that a little bit later on too. And I think perhaps the biggest thing to look for in today's game was S.J. Green. He was eight catches away from 700. That's a huge milestone. And he was 90 yards away from 10,000, an even bigger milestone. So with all that to look forward to, I was really excited actually to go into this game. Let me give you a rundown of what we got coming up here on the podcast. On first down, I'll give you a game summary, go through some of my notes that I scribbled down on the back of napkins like Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> my producer's shaking his head. It's a Gettysburg reference, Gettysburg address. I'm not sure if he's upset about the fact that I've substituted the back of envelopes for the back of napkins or that I'm comparing a podcast about a 3-12 and football team to the Gettysburg address, probably the latter. On second down, we'll do some chalk talk over system, strategy, things that worked tonight, things that I thought they missed on a little bit. 
And on third down, we'll continue to look ahead. What's up next in the new Pinball Clemens era? What changes are we going to see? Uh, which coaches are going to be around here next year? Which player is going to be around here next year? I'll tell you who I think the quarterback of the team is going to be, and that's all coming up on third down. Offside. Wait till you hear Red Cash and say first down. That penalty is declined. Here it comes. First down. Here it comes. First down, says Red Cashin. Early in this game, Will Arndt looked like a quarterback who had been playing semi-pro football in Fort McMurray. And he credit to him, he made some really nice adjustments. It helps that he's got Joe Pow Pow out there as his quarterback's coach, whispering in his ear. You could see him every time he left the field, getting notes, talking it through with him. And he improved significantly throughout the game. He actually had a really solid second half. But in the first half, it, it started the way you would think it would start when you're out there making your, your first career start as a quarterback. His very first pass of the game, he was like three or four yards beyond the line of scrimmage, and then he threw it to a player that was out of bounds. And that was you know, a sign of things to come in that first half. But they slowly worked their way down the field, a couple Argo penalties, and they ended up kicking a 47-yard field goal that went off the left upright and threw somehow. Argos seemed to respond pretty well initially. Macbeth was driving the Argos down. Again, same kind of thing, short passes, mostly targeting S.J. Green. Uh, you know, they're trying to get him. They really wanted him to get that 700th catch and 10,000 yards at home. They're in Montreal next week, and they really wanted it to happen at home in front of their fans, not in Montreal, uh, you know, where he has a bit of history. So they end up getting down to the 10-yard line. Declan Cross catches the ball in the middle. He's stripped, and we're thinking, oh, no, here we go again. We're going to lose this one, too. It's it's 3 nothing. Ottawa's got the ball back, but they didn't end up doing anything with it at all. On the next drive, more S.J. Green. He actually finished the first quarter with four catches, 67 yards. Uh, and there was a really nice shot. Uh, Bethel Thompson had a, a really good game, except for one play that I'll highlight maybe a little bit later on. But he had an opportunity for a touchdown on this second drive of the game. A beautiful fade to Darrell Walker in the end zone. For some reason, he tried to one-hand it. He spun around awkwardly, tried to one-hand it. It was a perfect pass. He just has to box out there, basically ride the defender, keep his, his cushion to the sideline, and then at the last second fade away and make that catch. And that's something that we've seen Walker do 100 times. I don't know why. Maybe he didn't pick up the ball in time, but he spun around awkwardly, threw one hand at it, and we ended up settling for a, a 19-yard field goal to tie it at three. Uh, Crepinia coming in to to kick that short field goal. <laughs> I had, it was a great uh, great moment pregame. I was field level and taking a look at Crepinia just stretching and warming up. And he went over to talk to Jamal Campbell, and these guys couldn't look more different. Uh, Crepinia, who stands, I don't know, like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, uh, probably about uh, maybe 170, 175 pounds. And Jamal Campbell has got to be 6'7". Uh, 320. He's just one of the one of the biggest guys on the team, and Crepinia by far the smallest. And they were just having a great conversation, laughing. They look like old buddies, both OUA guys, and so I'm sure they've you know been around the block a bit together. But uh, yeah, it was a really funny sort of visual as I was watching a pregame warmup. The first quarter came to an end with a Tremaine Washington interception. It was a really nice play. R.J. Harris came across pre-snap. He cut back in on sort of like a, a, a Texas route or a diamond route. Washington slipped, and I think I think there aren't is looking at him, sees the defender fall, and he tries to get rid of that ball a little too quickly. He wasn't quite ready and mechanics wise to throw that pass. And the ball was behind Harris. Really nice play by Washington to get up off the ground, lunge at that ball and pick it off. And that's how the first quarter came to an end. Three three tie. In the second quarter, another Huge opportunity for Bethel Thompson to Armani Edwards this time on a corner route. A, a great throw and yet again another one-handed attempt. And, I, and we're seeing a lot of that this year. I've talked about that before. And we, we saw it a few times in this game and just the, you know, the earlier what could have been a touchdown pass earlier in the, in the first quarter. And Armani Edwards here again had great position on the corner route. It was a great ball. For some reason, he throws up one hand and can't come down with the pass. A lot of punting in the first half. There wasn't a lot of action. And then with like four minutes left in the half, there was a pass interference on Green in the end zone. Uh, Franklin comes in at the one-yard line. And first and goal from the one, they attempted a pass to Ryan Bombin, which 
they will never attempt again. And I think it's the last time I felt bad for him. And Ryan Bauman is a great athlete. He's a really good guard. But that's the thing. He's a really good guard. And they lined him up in the, the package that they set up in when Franklin comes in the game, this double tight package, heavy package. Bombin, instead of playing guard, widens out to tight end. He's eligible uh, from the tight end spot. And Franklin, everyone thinks, is going to quarterback sneak because he's the best at the quarterback sneak in the world. And I don't know why they didn't just try that. But, uh, yeah, first down, Franklin takes the snap, drops back. Bombin couldn't be more open. And for some reason, Franklin put it up high for him. Bombin had to leap for it. And he's just not built for that, and he couldn't come down with it. Uh, but, man, he was wide open. On second down, Franklin tries to sneak, kind of nonchalant sneak, and it didn't get in. And then on third down, it was a pretty easy walk into the end zone. Argos are up 10-3, uh, just a couple of minutes left in, in the half. And Arn started making some dangerous throws. Like A couple of minutes left, I think he wanted to try and get back on the board. He started throwing passes over the middle that I think in previous eras would have had guys knocked right out. But because of the rule changes and how things are now, the guys are still taking hits, but not the same kind of hits that they would have taken years ago. And I could see a couple times where receivers went to talk to him after a pass and said, you know, you can't put that ball out there for me. With 136 left in the half, S.J. Green goes over the 10,000 career yards mark with a 19 yards, uh, 19 yard reception. And it was a really nice play to, to hit that record on. It was a great catch. It wasn't just, you know, a dinky four-yard uh, hook with, you know, a minute 36 left and them playing uh, a prevent. It was a really nice play. They had quads to the right. Uh, SJ was the number three receiver. Smith with the big body there was, was number four. So SJ cuts underneath him about 15 yards in behind the backers, makes a great shoestring catch, landing at the 50-yard line. And, yeah, with that, he was over 10,000 yards. It was a really nice moment. And you could see how emotional he was when he hit that mark. You know, in front of the home crowd on a nice play like that. Uh, he's now 18th all-time in CFL receiving yards, which is pretty awesome. And, and again, just uh, insult to injury for Brian Bombin. This is probably the last time I'll talk about Bombin during, during this podcast. But uh, he got hurt on that play. And he was actually hurt twice in that first half. Um, it looked like he, he tweaked his ankle a little bit uh, the first time. And I, don't, I couldn't tell what happened to him the second time. But while everyone is celebrating and they're... The announcer is talking about how he's over 10,000 yards, S.J. Green. Everyone's on their feet cheering, and Bombin is being tended to on the field, trainers around him. And meanwhile, everyone's cheering and clapping and fireworks and, and, and everything else. So it was, just, it was just not Brian Bombin's day. So Macbeth strings together a great two-minute drive. Wilder was going crazy. He was looking for contact. There were, you know, we were, we we're still connecting short passes, short to mid-range passes over the middle, but every time Wilder got the ball, it, for whatever reason tonight, he was looking to crush people. He hit Sherrod Baltimore so hard on this, uh, I think it was like the third last play of the half. He didn't need to. He was, you know, the, Sherrod wasn't even in his way. It's like he ran out of his way just to give Sherrod a shot. I don't know if there's any history between those guys, but it's just such a weird thing to look at. We end up getting a touchdown to Armani Edwards in the corner of the end zone. This is a really nice play, too, and this is Bethel Thompson at his best. We had trips left. They were in cover three, but because there wasn't that much time left in the half, they were playing with their heels at the goal line. So uh, we're only on like the, the 10 or 15-yard line. So they had their heels planted at the goal line in cover three with a really big end zone in behind them, and, and we ended up having two guys sneak in, in behind. One of them was Edwards, and Bethel Thompson rolled to his left, bought a bit of time. And it was just a nice, easy pass for him into the corner of the end zone. And Edwards just standing there, was able to reel it in. And so, yeah, at the half, we look great. 17-3, as we go into halftime, things are feeling good. It didn't feel like your typical Argos game. Almost everyone playing well, and Bethel Thompson really having a nice game. Then came the third quarter, which just didn't start out that well. Ottawa opened with an onside kick, recovered it at their 50, and Arndt came up with some new confidence. I think he looked pretty good. His best drive of the entire game was that first drive of the first half, and I think it was probably, it looked like a very scripted drive. And they'd made some adjustments at halftime, and I'll talk about some of those adjustments a bit later, but basically the Argos was playing a lot of cover three. And so when they came out to start the second half, they basically adjusted this, giving him some nice, easy passes in anticipation of this defensive look. 
And it was stuff that he was able to make. And so he was able to start driving Ottawa up and down the field. And post-game, he talked about how the Argos had him feeling really uncomfortable in the first half. But once he got a handle on what they were doing, he made some adjustments and had a productive second half. And it showed that he just looked so much more confident. He had a bunch of short passes, ended up hitting a big screen to Gillanders to get inside the 10. And a nice play design on their touchdown. It was man coverage inside the 10. Ottawa went late into quads, then suddenly brought two receivers flying over to the right side, sent them back again, but then right at the snap, R.J. Harris, who's one of those motion guys, suddenly cuts back out right, and Williams just couldn't stay with him. It's impossible. You can't. It was one of those things where if you know for sure you've got man coverage, I, I don't think you're going to, unless you've seen that play before and you've prepped for that play before, you're, you're going to beat the defender every time, and Williams just couldn't get there. So it's 17-10 Argos. Bethel Thompson responds nicely. Short passes to Jimmy Ralph, Edwards. He even ran the ball, his only carry of the night, for a first downs, like an eight-yard gain. And then a huge play to SJ Green for the 700th catch of his career. And what a night for SJ. He ends up with like 170 yards, 10 catches. But on both of his record-setting catches, they were highlight reel catches. And that's what made it so wonderful. In this case, it was quads to the left, cover zero. There was a free safety blitz, but the safety, it looked like he was trying to disguise it just a little too long, so he never really got there and made a difference. So Bethel Thompson had time. He ends up lofting it up for, for Green, who has Anthony Chaffee on him. But it's a bit unfair. There's no help to the inside. There's so much space to work with coming out of that quads look. And it was a great throw, a diving catch by SJ, and we've seen him do that 100 times before. And then on the very next play, Ottawa's in man. Edwards has a deep comeback, like in the, you know, maybe five yards left in the end zone. A perfect throw from Bethel Thompson. Nice catch, 24-10. The score for the Argos, they really responded nicely to that solid opening drive from Ottawa. And then on Ottawa's next possession, they, you, this is another play that you should see this play. Just if you didn't catch the game, you didn't watch it, and you're just relying on my summary. I can describe it as well as I like, but you've got to see this play. They're setting up for a 52-yard Lewis Ward field goal. But remember, the score is 24-10. This, is, this isn't this is turning into a field goal game. Time's ticking down in the third quarter. It's such an obvious fake. They're kicking a 52-yarder into a heavy wind. And, of course, it is a fake. You know, Everyone was saying it out loud, like, watch fake because it couldn't have been more uh, of a classic fake scenario. Jonathan Jennings, back of quarterbacks, the holder, he sprints up to the line, and he has Nigel Romick wide open, but Jennings, instead of sitting him there, it would have been such an easy first down and then maybe 20 yards more. He leads Romick into the path of Chris Rainey, who was deep to try and pick up a, a short field goal. And Rainey came sprinting in like 40 yards, full speed, and absolutely crushed Romick. It was one of the hardest hits I've seen all year, and by Chris Rainey of all people. Uh, Romick bounced right back up again. I don't know how. I, I definitely would have died. So we end up with a 15-yard penalty, which I think was more than fair. And then on the next play, we were able to create a turnover. Argos baited aren't perfectly. There's a half-black blitz off the edge, and the backer immediately sprinted out to the slot. So on this play, when, when Arndt saw the halfback blitz, any young quarterback is, is taught to in that situation, you see the halfback blitz, you throw to that spot. And so his slot receiver that the halfback was lined up over top of uh, hooks it up short. But because they were anticipating this exact reaction, we had Toby Antigua for some reason was, was playing Mac. And... On the snap of the ball, he was looking for that pick. He was baiting him from the word go. He sprints to where he knows that ball is going to go, caught it in stride and took off, got all the way down to the Ottawa 40. Grappini ends up adding another field goal. It's 27-10, and that sends us into the fourth quarter. And Argus fans are feeling so comfortable at this point. We're, we're up 17. It's like a party. We all got our cowboy hats on. And it, you kind of forgot about the fact that, yeah, this is the CFL, and we're – we're a two-win team here, so you can't you can't count Ottawa out at this point. But it, you know it's, it continued to go pretty well. Lang had another sack, and this is where, where the Argos really started picking up sacks. They had four sacks on the night. I think I, I feel like they were all in the fourth quarter. I could be wrong on that. And 
three of them anyway were off four-man rushes, just like this one. It was a stunt, and Lang got in there for, for the sack. Uh, Ottawa was forced to punt. And then Bethel Thompson made what I think was probably his only big mistake of the night. He was really trying to get S.J. Green a touchdown. So Argos drive down to the Ottawa 10, and Red Blacks are in cover three cut. S.J. Green's in the slot. He's got a dig route. Macbeth just trying to force that ball to him, but he doesn't see Kevin Brown playing linebacker expand quickly. And this is partly Wilder Jr.'s fault because there was no threat of run on that play. You generally inside the 10, if they're going to play zone, you're trying to bring those linebackers in a little bit. And if it's not a play fake, it's just even the threat of run because that's what they're thinking initially. You're looking run, you're reading run. But in this play, Wilder Jr. walked out a little early to get into his route. The linebackers immediately expanded fast, and that's why Kevin Brown was able to cut under S.J. Green on that play. And really, Bethel Thompson should have seen him. He was trying to force it in. But I think that comes from being up so much and trying to make this guy's night. It, you know, it ended up being S.J. Green's night anyway. But Bethel Thompson trying to force it in there you know, made a huge mistake. And then on the next Ottawa drive, Alden Darby has a chance to basically end the game with a pick. He drops it. Because it looked like he tweaked something, he injured maybe an ankle, hopefully not an Achilles. It, it actually did look a lot like you know, when you see an Achilles injury, other than him, he didn't immediately grab for the back of his Achilles, which is, is one of the indicators, but it, it definitely looked sore, and it was why he dropped the ball. It went right into his hands. He had it, and then as soon as he landed, he dropped the ball as he started hopping around in pain, and he didn't come back in, and hopefully we'll hear over the next couple of days that Darby's okay, and it's just a, a mild sprain or something like that. Ottawa ends up missing a field goal, but they get a, a rouge on that play. So Argos are now up 16, 28, 11. And things are starting to get chippy now. Their punch is thrown. Justin Thomas gets thrown out of the game. And this is actually nice to see from two teams that, and not that you know, I, I'm not a fan of, of chippiness in football games, but what it did speak to is that these are two teams that still cared and they were still trying to play and trying to win games. And uh, unfortunately, you know, it escalated a little bit. You shouldn't have punches thrown. Thomas gets thrown out. Like I said, and a couple of plays after that, we end up giving up like 25 yards in penalties. And then after that, Arndt finds Dominic Rhymes for a touchdown. Uh, Argos are in cover one. We're sending heat, which really didn't work for the Argos tonight. Uh, Rhymes ended up with a fade route on the sideline, uh, ends up beating his coverage. And, you know, Ford just couldn't find the ball. And our free obviously had too far to come over uh, with that kind of distance. So it's 28 to 18 now. And we start getting a little nervous at this point. Ottawa comes right back with an onside kick. They recover. We have our hands team out there, and Darrell Walker drops it. It hits him right in the hands. He's got at least a five-yard cushion, and he drops the football. Ottawa recovers it. And a couple of minutes later, Ward kicks a 50-yard field goal. 145 to go, and it's 28-21, and we're thinking, uh-oh, here we go. We've seen this before. And Argo fans are, are stressing. It was pretty quiet in that stadium at this point. But... We managed to get a first down, Wilder Jr. with another huge carry. He had a great night tonight, and that just about sealed it. We ended up punting it away. They had one more chance. They got the ball back with 18 seconds left, needing a touchdown. And again, Toby Antigua with another interception, his second of the night. He's a defensive lineman who ended up playing a lot of a lot of Mac. And he, you know, he's played a lot. He's a pretty interchangeable guy. But he's not the guy that you're thinking of when you're thinking, Anargo had two picks tonight. Who was it? Toby Antigua is not the name that jumps into your into your brain. So 28-21 the final, and the Argos win. It was a huge relief. Great end to a wonderful night. It's always nice to get a win, but add in the SJ Green stuff, the fact that it's a win over Ottawa. The only thing that could have made this better is if it were Hamilton, I guess. But otherwise, it was it was a wonderful night, and everyone left that stadium feeling feeling pretty good. Pass interference by the offense, number 80. 10-yard penalty, repeat second down. I thought the defensive game plan tonight was really solid. The Argos have played a lot of cover one all year long, and I think probably coming into this game, knowing that they're going to be starting a quarterback for his first ever start, they were probably really counting on seeing a lot of that man coverage. And so a lot of the plays they had running this week for Arndt were probably man beaters. And so I thought it was a, a clever move on the Argos staff uh, on their parts to throw in a lot of cover three just to change things up a little bit. And we saw that all first half, a ton of cover threes. They bounce back and forth between uh, cut and hold. And the few occasions where 
the Argos did send blitzes. They didn't actually work. That was one thing that I, I think is an indicator that shows you that Arndt was preparing for that all week. Because anytime we were in man, especially early, he knew exactly where to go with the ball. He was pretty quick. He got the ball out of his hands fast. Anytime we blitzed, he knew what was coming, and he was able to hit the check down. And and the few times that we did get, you know, the few times that our blitzer did get there, we we got a roughing the passer penalty or, uh, you know, made a gaffe somewhere else. So we were far better off playing that cover three in the first half. And then when the second half came around and Ottawa made those adjustments, so we came out still the second half playing that cover three, again, back and forth between hold and cut. And what Ottawa came out doing was they were basically running variations on hook concepts. And they were just letting Arndt take a quick step and throw the ball. So essentially, uh, whichever player, whichever defender was bailing out, if it's the halfback bailing out, then Arndt's going to hit that number two receiver on a hook, just a five or six yard hook. That's all they were going for. And if it's the corner that's got deep third, then he's going to hit his number one receiver on the outside with a quick hook. And that was that was all they were doing, four, five, six yards at a time. But these were easy throws and catches, and they were able to put some drives together. And after they started seeing some success, then that's when the Argos started changing things up, and that's when we started to see some more creative blitzes. Um, we ended up getting one sack, I know for sure, off of a well-disguised halfback blitz uh, with some man, with some a late shift in man coverage, um, and that was that was a really nice play. And I, full credit to the defensive staff for not only a good game plan, but making those in-game adjustments to make sure they could shut down Ottawa ultimately. Offensively, just about everyone had a great game for the Argos, maybe aside from Darrell Walker wasn't great tonight, and I think Rainey could have been a little better as well, but pretty much everyone else had a great game. The protection was awesome from the offensive line. Bethel Thompson had all day to throw. They were creating huge holes, getting up to the second level. Um, so many different times you'd see them run these combo blocks that were exactly the way you draw them up, and that was creating a ton of room for Wilder Jr., who had a, a really good game as well. Also some really nice creative play designs. Th- something that Ottawa did well was shutting down most of our RPO package. So the way that the Argos have been running this the last few weeks, essentially they'd have, so you picture the running back on the right side of the quarterback. You've got a slot on the left side coming across the formation. And at that point, the quarterback is has got a a read option he's reading the the right side contain and if he sees what he likes he hands the ball off if he doesn't see what he likes he pulls and he can either run it which obviously bethel thompson doesn't do a lot of franklin might run it but bethel thompson will usually then hit that slot who's usually smith coming across and uh, he'll hit that slot for a short gain and every time we ran that play ottawa was all over it the only time we caught them on it was when we showed a really creative variation. And that's one thing I wanted to talk about. So it's that same action where you've got Rodney Smith coming across from left to right. You've got your, your running back in, in King or line up on the right side. And while it looks like we're setting up that exact same way as Macbeth pulls the ball and starts rolling to his right, he's now got Rodney Smith underneath for a shovel pass. And it was wide open when we ran that. It was a, it just a really nice tweak. And that's an example of some creativity from uh, from the offensive staff where they know exactly what Ottawa is planning for. They've seen, okay, Ottawa's seen this film, this film, this film. They're coming to this game. They're going to try and shut down that RPO play. So let's run it. But then we'll run it a second time with this shovel variation. And it was a key first down in the first half when they ran it. I thought that was a really nice, really, really nice find by them. The only question I really had offensively, and this has been bothering me for a couple of weeks, I don't know why Chris Rainey is getting as many snaps as he is. I don't feel like he's got a huge advantage in terms of pass protection and blitz pickups. Uh, He really didn't get that many carries, but he was on the field a lot. And I think when you've got Wilder Jr., who especially on a day where he's running the ball well like he was today, I think it's a disservice when you're not out there running him. Or even if you don't run him. A play fake or just even having him there causes those linebackers to take the read steps and then gives you a little bit more space to throw him because they're certainly not doing it the same way when Chris Rainey's in there. They just weren't respecting the run. And I think if I'm Wilder Jr., I'm asking that question too. I'm also probably, I'm also, I was looking at Wilder Jr. after 
after we after Franklin tried to tried to run that play to Brian Bauman, I was looking at Wilder Jr. and he was sitting on the trainer's table, not because he was injured, just because it was just a place to sit. And he was watching that, sort of shaking his head. He's thinking to himself, I, I can only imagine he's as he's watching Bauman drop a ball in the end zone from the one yard line. He might be thinking, why am I why am I not in the game right now? Uh, getting this one yard touchdown run, which I, I think is a fair question. The other thing that I, I thought the Argos did really nicely was they took advantage of the mismatch they had in SJ Green going up against Anthony Chaffee. That was one that they were winning all night long, and they did a nice job of scheming SJ Green open. But the frustrating thing about this is, so the reason they did this, their motivation for doing this, SJ Green's their best receiver. They want to get him the 700 catches. They want to get him the 10,000 yards. So they deliberately scheme him open. Why aren't we doing this every week? If he's your best receiving threat, and you clearly can do it, we saw that tonight as they schemed him open for 10 catches on 12 targets, and not to mention a couple huge penalties for PI. Why can't you do that every week? Why are we not seeing SJ Green schemed open every week where we're setting picks for him, where he's running underneath guys, where we just find ways to get the ball into his hands? And, you know, that that's the, one of the negatives that comes out of this game is just the frustration and seeing, you know, how well some things went tonight and wondering how come, how come that doesn't happen every night? Ball start. Offense. Everyone except the center. <laughs> Third down. So going forward, what does all of this mean? Well, Pinball was doing a lot of interviews today, as he always does. He's so great with that stuff. I'm really honestly excited to have Pinball back into things. And I don't know how involved he's actually going to be. I think he's probably going to start bringing some guys in. I think this is more, I think it's a little bit of an image change. I think that it's, you know, to turn things around a little bit in terms of the way everyone's feeling. It just made everyone so much more positive watching him pregame going around high-fiving all the guys, getting them hyped up for the game. It's just, it was a different atmosphere having pinball in there. And and it always is. And I'm sure you listening to me right now, you've had some sort of interaction with Pinball Clemens at some point in your life because he's met just about everybody in Ontario. And he has this ability to make every single person he talks to feel like the most important person in the room. And he's just so personable, so genuine, and just such an amazing guy that that alone, I think, is a reason to bring him on board and just change the the tone of things because it was getting pretty negative, as it does when, you know, you have two wins. And so I think this, you know, I think you saw some signs of that tonight. I think the attitude was really good. I think people were really positive. Everyone was out there having fun. But what does this mean going forward? What's he going to do? What changes, uh, what changes uh, might he make? Now, he said in one of his interviews, he talked about how this isn't new. This didn't come out of nowhere. I guess they've been, I don't know if pestering is the right word, but they've been asking him all season, I guess, if he would come in, or at least, you know, from at the halfway point onwards, if he had come in and he, I guess, said, no, 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 I, you know, I've got too many things on the go. I'm very involved in this. And he does so much work in the community with different charities. And, you know, I can imagine he's one of the busiest guys as it is. But he loves this team so much, he basically gave in at the end and said, fine, I'll come in and do it. But I would imagine that he is going to find a replacement for himself uh, and also find a head coach. And these are probably going to be guys he's worked with before, guys that he knows pretty well. I wouldn't be surprised if in the offseason we see someone like Eric Tillman come in to the GM spot. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Mike O'Shea come in as a head coach. And basically everybody on staff get let go. Uh, I'm kind of... Again, I, I, I don't want to say I'm hoping for that because I never hope that anyone loses their job. I know how hard they work and how much they put into it. But I think this is one of those things where you, you sort of have to start over. And for them to bring in someone like Mike O'Shea, they want to give him full control over his staff. And so I wouldn't be surprised if they ax everybody, bring in O'Shea, which I'd love to see. I was tweeting a couple of weeks ago, you know, how is Mike O'Shea not, not the head coach of this team? Uh, he, he is... Um, one of the most well-known Argos, one of the most popular Argos of all time. And there he is coaching in Winnipeg. So hopefully Pinball can find a way to bring him in and sort of start rounding up the rounding up the, the staff for next year. The attitude today I talked about a few times. 
the scrappiness, the not the chippiness, but the scrappiness I loved. I really liked how you could tell that every single player on the field was giving you everything they had. And I don't think you often see that from a team that has two wins. And it was clear from the opening kick that every single Argo that stepped onto the field was going to give you everything they had tonight. And I think that that also you know, brings us back to what is so wonderful about bringing Pinball Clemens in uh, at this point in the season. Because it may not make sense on the surface. You say, well, why, why do that now? There's only a couple of games left. I think this is why. Because then you can get a little bit more out of player evaluation and really get a sense of you know, some positivity going into the offseason and give the players this idea that things are going to be different next year. And I, I really believe they are. And I don't think that's me with my Argos hat on. I think that's they, maybe a bit of that is the optimistic me who's going to be watching all these games. And I want to see some good games. But I really do believe that. Who's going to be the quarterback next year? I have felt all season long that neither James Franklin or McLeod Bethel Thompson could be the starting quarterback next year. I felt all season long that it had to be someone else. It had to be someone outside the organization. In the last few hours, I may have changed my mind. I now think, I think, I think, I'm going to have to think this through a little bit more, but as I'm feeling at this moment, I feel surprisingly strongly that Bethel Thompson is going to be the Argos starting quarterback next year. I know he's had some really good numbers all season long, but those haven't translated into wins. And some of the things that we saw happen tonight, his one big mistake tonight, was the result of exactly that same kind of thing that we've talked about all season long, where he's great between the 20s, his numbers are awesome, and then once he gets down to the 20-yard line, the 10-yard line, everything falls apart. And that happened today with that interception in the end zone. And you sort of worry that that's just that's who he is. I think there's enough there. And I was, thinking about, I was thinking about this tonight as I was watching him play and having a good game and just writing down notes of things that he was doing well. I don't know who else you go out and get. I don't think there's anyone else currently in the CFL that you could bring in, that you have the ability to bring in, first of all, but that would also outplay McLeod Bethel Thompson. I think he is the most likely starting quarterback for next year, and I think that I'm okay with that as well. And, and that's something, again, that I wouldn't have said a couple of weeks ago, but I think I've come to terms with that, and I know how hard it is to find a good quarterback, that I think this is probably going to be our guy going forwards. Unless they can find somebody that isn't currently in the CFL, you know, maybe, and maybe he's a rookie, maybe he's you know, someone who's been bouncing around a little bit south of the border, but unless they can find a guy, you know, use their scouts, use their connections, find a guy, find that next, find that next Damon Allen, find that next Ricky Ray and bring him in at a young age. And unless they can do that, then I think McLeod Bethel Thompson is, is going to be the quarterback next year. And I think the way that I see this shaping up, I think we're going to bring in a good staff and I think he has a really good chance of having a great season. So that's what I'm hoping for anyway. Our next game, we've got Argos at Montreal this coming Friday, a week today. It's a 7 o'clock start, and you know, hopefully we see another effort like we saw today. It's a much tougher challenge in Montreal, and if, I think if the Argos can bring out the same energy and attitude that they came out with today, I think that's going to be a, a really nice game. So again, the final, 28-21 Argos over the Red Blacks. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Fight the foe, foe, foe.